Happy Lord's Day to all of you. Good to see you out this morning. Good to have our visitors with us, as has been said. This morning's reading is going to be from Zechariah, chapter 14. The last chapter before the last book of the Old Testament. Just to give you an idea of where it's at. So find Malachi, chapter 1, go back one chapter and you're there. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 for our text this morning. Zechariah, chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Verse 1 reads, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, and when he fought, as when he fought on the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne once again this day with thankful hearts, Father, for your many blessings, for your watchful care, for your constant provisions for us. Father, we ask now that you be with us in this reading, that your spirit would guide into all truth. Open up our hearts and give us understanding, Lord, especially, Father, I pray that you would convict us, help us to realize that we are sinners before you, cause us to have a desire to repent and turn to you before it's everlastingly too late. Especially, Father, for those that are lost, I pray your conviction would move powerfully, that then he might be met even this day. Father, forgive us where we fail you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So, I want to... Uh, deal with a subject that has been on my heart for quite some time, several weeks actually, not all that long, but it actually came as I was preparing for a lesson in um, the Gospel of John for our Life and Ministry of Jesus Bible Studies. And the one verse that really simply pricked my mind and what caused me to think about these things was, actually let's turn there, John chapter 8, did I say John chapter 8? I'm not sure if I did. John chapter 8, this one verse that reads, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And this is right after all, everybody had dispersed after some teachings with Jesus and the Pharisees, the scribes and the priests. Uh, it says that they all went to their homes. And Jesus departed and went to the Mount of Olives. And it got me thinking about that place, the Mount of Olives. Jesus went there often during his ministry. We're told several times, I do think that it was more than we're told, even an unspecified place, perhaps, where it says that Jesus went to pray. And one thing we might consider as we're thinking about that is how important it is to have a place that we go to pray. Uh, the Mount of Olives uh, during this time was probably pretty beautiful with the olive uh, vineyards that were there and there were probably even grape vineyards that were there also from what I understand oftentimes where there are olive vineyards there are grape vineyards uh, two very precious commodities um, in the Middle East especially to Israel at that time and we'll talk about the purpose of that in a moment but Jesus had a solitary place where he would go to pray and he even told us in the model prayer how important that is to have a private place to go the Mount of Olives, which I don't know if you have a map in your Bible you can look at or maybe picture in your mind if you can, um, the city. And it, it interests me that all of these places that we read about really are within walking distance. Of course, there really was no other way of travel at that time. You know, we travel great distances in a short amount of time. And they would probably cover, it seems like about seven miles or so, less than 10 miles was a day's journey. So a day's journey for us. I, I actually left my house one time with Susan and a couple other people. Um, at five o'clock in the morning, we drove to Olympia, Washington, and we got there at 11 o'clock at night. So 18 hours of travel, which is almost a full day, but we traveled, how many miles? That's a lot of miles. That was unconceivable at this time. But they would walk, 
Everything within Jerusalem, the surrounding cities, was really pretty much a day's journey. They could walk there. The Mount of Olives itself was literally outside the eastern gate, I believe, of Jerusalem, kind of overlooking the city itself. It might have been at the place where it tells us that Jesus um, stood overlooking Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you together as a mother hen gathers, gathers her chicks, but you would not. Um, and no doubt we can see the emotion in that statement. And it caused him to weep, I believe, over Jerusalem. It was an ancient place, very old place that originally wasn't, um, didn't belong to the people of God. I want to read a passage for you concerning um, this olive tree and what it represents, if I can find that passage. Yeah, in Deuter I'm just going to read this for you. You can follow along, along if you like. I've printed it out for myself. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 11 says, It shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which I swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things, which thou fillest not, for, um, and wells dig, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, when they shall have eaten and be full. It's not too far-fetched to think that some of these olive trees, these groves, uh, were there when at least Jacob, perhaps, maybe even Abraham and Isaac, that they saw the very same trees that were there when Jesus would, would go visit the Mount of Olives. Um, these trees lived to be very old and grew very big. And they're, they're at, we're going to cover a point in, towards the end of this message. How as far as, um, what's this, I, I, sometimes I hate these common terms that become popular, um, but optics which means to look at something. This isn't a real pretty tree to look at. In fact, in my opinion, it's rather ugly. It doesn't have much of a shape. The, the, the root and the, the trunk grow kind of all kinds of different ways, especially the older it gets. Um, and then the branches, they just go out without any real rhyme or reason. But they produce a very wonderful and necessary fruit, which is the olive. But it's an ugly tree, and these trees would live rather long. There are some that suggest even in today's world, I think the oldest known olive tree is in, in Greece, which is still a part of that Mediterranean area. Um, but it's about 3,000 years old, from what I understand. It was hard to date these trees, but they are very old. So it's not too far-fetched to think that when Jesus go, would go to these trees, that they were there when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were there. This Mount of Olive area, on this hill, this hillside that kind of stretches, sort of wrapping itself around Jerusalem, really has three main sites. Two of the most important sites were the, um, the Mount of Olives, which included the Garden of Gethsemane, which you recognize that name. We're going to talk about that as well. And then towards the other side, I believe it goes north, of Jerusalem is where Mount Calvary was, and you'll recognize that name as well. Um, that is where he was crucified, of course, and died. Um, Mount Calvary very likely could be the very spot that Abraham offered up Isaac, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years prior to the sacrifice actually being um, known. Some people think in Jewish tradition um, that this area here Jerusalem and the surrounding areas is actually not just the center of the world, which actually um, geographically, um, I'm not sure how people look at it necessarily, um, but it, geographically it could be what would be considered the center of the world. Now in my mind, I think it depends on where you're looking at it from <laughs> and how you're calculating it. But um, spiritually speaking, not only do people think that it's the center of the world, but that is the center of the universe. In fact, in Jewish tradition, it, some think this is the very beginning of creation, that this is where God really kind of came in and everything began. And, you know, I, don't, I, I certainly don't believe in the Big Bang theory. Certainly God created everything. 
But as he created everything, especially this world, the earth itself, which seems to be also the center of the universe. You ever think about that? Of, of all of the planets that are out there and the stars, which are so vast and go out so far, what is it about this planet here that is so significant? Well, it's part of God's plan. And even further than that, um, thinking about the fact that in all of the universe on this little one planet is you and me. And God pays special attention to us. And this place here, Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, seems to be the one place throughout history where he has decided to commune with man. So it carries a lot of, um, a lot of weight with it, this Mount of Olives. Not only the, the fruit that comes from the tree, which was important. Um, in fact, the very first place that the olive is mentioned, it's, it's actually the olive leaf, is in Genesis chapter 8, verse 11. You might remember this from Sunday school. It says uh, concerning when they were going to, when Noah and his family were trying to see if everything was done and they could finally actually get off of the ark. Uh, this one verse says, The dove came unto him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, so Noah knew that the waters had abated from off of the earth. Now we have no idea, no way of knowing where that olive leaf came from. But wouldn't it be interesting if it came from the very area where all of these olive trees that are so significant during the life of Christ came from? In fact, this, this Mount of Olives, it really was very close to Jerusalem. And um, logistically, it was necessary because in the temple, they would utilize the olives and the, especially the oil that came from the olives. And you know, if you could just picture in your mind. Now, I, I like olives. Um, my memory of olives goes back to when I was a child, especially during like um, holiday times, Thanksgiving, when there'd be like a bowl of olives there. I would grab five <laughs> olives. And you could probably imagine what an eight-year-old child is going to do with five olives. Of course, I'm going to put one on each finger <laughs> and then eat them. But there's a lot of work that goes into preparing those olives. Olives, my understanding is, and it, I'm trying to look further into this. There's a lot more than you're going to get um, that I'm not going to be able to, to give to you than this message that I want to look into. But olives are very hard when they come off the tree. They don't necessarily ripen on the tree. And my understanding today to get olives to where that they are actually edible, they have to prepare them in, I think today's method is using lye which is a very dangerous chemical. Um, but it softens up the olive so that it's usable. Um, olive oil is also very popular um, in our culture today, especially now with keto, keto diets being so popular. Um, it's said to be one of the healthiest oils for you. It's very high in fat and it virtually has zero carbs. So, you know, you can put olive oil in everything. Use it in your salads, use it to to fry things in, it's very good and it is very healthy. It's heart, it's a heart healthy fat. I don't know if they thought about that or not, but they used the oil for the lamps in the temple. And it was very significant because this oil that came from the olives, and this goes back to uh, an ancient time as well, in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, we read this and it, um, and thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure. Now, every old King James verse says it this way, oil, olive. I say olive oil, but nonetheless, beaten for the light. So in order to get the juice or the oil out of the olive, it had to be squeezed out very harshly or beaten out. You can see where this is going, I think, um, if you know your Bible. But the oil that was used, um, it was for the lamps to continually burn. Some of the lamps that were used in the temple would continually burn, always. So they had to keep it full of oil. They had to keep replenishing the oil. It would last a while, but it wouldn't you know, burn forever by itself. They had to keep replenishing the oil. You might also be familiar with a parable that Jesus told. Um, in fact, one of the, one of the th things... I don't like that, but whatever. One of the things that Jesus did during his ministry, a teaching, um, a parable on this, was 
<clears throat> probably on the Mount of Olives when he talked about the ten virgins and how there were um, two sets of five virgins, each having lamps full of oil, and some of them would, would never replenish the oil. And when the, the Lord came, um, five of them were not ready because they didn't replenish their oil. They had to go out and buy oil, and it was too late when the Lord came back, and they weren't ready when he returned. But five of the other virgins kept re replenishing the oil in their lamps. So there's a lot of significance to this, a lot of teaching on several different levels. The tree itself actually represents the covenant people of God. Now, I read the, the passage in Deuteronomy chapter um, 6, verses 10 through 11, but it represents the covenant people of God, and most literally the promise that was made to Abraham himself. So if we look at in, well, let's look at Zechariah chapter 4, if you're still in Zechariah. If not, go back there. Zechariah chapter 4 this time. And I'll just read the first... Um, First couple of verses, first few verses. Zechariah chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 1 reads, And the angel that talked with me came again and walked with me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold. Now this, this should bring something to your memory. Hundreds of years after this point, John, the apostle, actually also sees a vision. He sees a vision of seven golden lampstands. And what we see here, candlesticks, if you will. And here, Zechariah sees the same thing. A candlestick with a bowl upon it and his, and his seven lamps thereon. And seven pipes to the lamps which were put on the top thereof. And again, this was for the, the light of the temple, but this is a, a, a spiritual heavenly vision that has a lot more significance than just a real golden lampstand. It's spiritual. Now, if we kind of put this all together with the knowledge that we have now in Revelation, in the first two chapters, the first chapter really, we see Jesus, the Lord himself, the Son of Man, walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands, and he identifies those as his church. So the point here is, is that this, this olive tree with everything about it, the branches, the leaves, the olive, the oil itself, all of it has a bigger picture than just something that is beneficial for us in this lifetime. It's one, actually one of the most beautiful um, visuals, really poetically, that God gives us of a spiritual vision. And it's not that hard to pick up on, actually. Um, if we kind of put the two covenants together, the Old and the New Covenant with the people of God uh, in the Old Testament, Israel, and then in the New Testament, of course, we know now what happened. Israel rejected the Messiah. They were cut off. And now God has opened it up to all the Gentiles. And we're going to talk about that in a moment as well. So these seven candlesticks here with the seven pipes, rather, seven lamps, were upon the top thereof. Now verse 3 says, Two of the olive trees by it. Two olive trees. Now what would those represent? Two olive trees. Well, I think very simply, both covenants. The old and the new. The two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bull, and the other upon the left side of the bull. And I answered and spake to the angel, that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel then talked with me, answered, and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by my might nor by power, excuse me, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That's a very popular verse that is actually taken out of context in its popular understanding. But it's a very good verse nonetheless. So verse 7 says, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, the, sh the shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord 
uh, came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel, they have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. Thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet of the, the hand of Zerubbabel, even though seven, they are in the eyes of the, the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the land. And I answered and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? It, it almost seemed like a foolish question to us because we have the completed word of God. But as these things are unfolding, it's, it's hard for them to understand. In fact, I think Paul put it best in the book of 1 Corinthians where he said, now we see in a, a mirror dimly, but then face to face. He's talking about the completed word of God coming to us. Your Bible is such a blessing to have, and yet I think we, we meaning all of mankind, and we meaning even God's people, probably take it a little bit for granted. Maybe not appreciating it, I'm not trying to judge anybody, but I know that it should get the highest appreciation among us because of what it contains in it. But it clearly reveals things to us that they could not see in the Old Testament. So verse 12 says, I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through thy two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said unto me, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth, the two anointed ones. Now that word, anointed, this may be interesting to you. It is to me. But it's the same word as the word Messiah, Mashiach. means anointed. The anointed in the Old Testament was Israel. And in picture, it was through the prophets, through the priests, and through the kings. Those that were anointed to offer up sacrifices, to represent God to the people, to represent the people to God. This was his anointed people. Then the, on the other hand is the Lord's church. Literally the Lord himself, who was anointed um, at his baptism. You'll remember what happened at his baptism. When John baptized him, he came up out of the water. And as he came up out of the water, it says that a spirit descended upon him, lighting upon him. And that was the anointing, making him the Messiah. And the next incident, similar to that, and this is not personal to us, it's really corporate to the people of God. On the day of Pentecost, his church was anointed with the same spirit. So the oil is actually very significant. And I want to talk about the oil uh, this morning. Before I move on, though, I want to kind of tie this together with what we're talking about as far as the olive tree itself. Romans chapter 11. Many of you have sat under Brother Ward's ministry for many years. So no doubt you've heard him talk about these verses. Uh, my pastor, my first pastor, Brother Rick Howard, when we were doing studies through the book of Romans, he made a comment that I've never forgotten, actually, and I've given it a lot of thought. But his comment was that Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 are really could be, the, could be called the key to understanding the entire Bible, the purpose of the entire Bible. It ties together the old and the new covenants. And how does it do that? Well, it utilizes the olive tree. We're going to read in chapter 11, starting in verse 12. Actually, skipping a lot, we could go back to verse 1, but I really just want to start here. Verse 12 says, Now if the fall of them, meaning Israel, the old covenant people, be the, um, be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Now you might think about Paul's ministry. Originally, he had a desire. His heart was for Israel, the people of God. Go back to chapter 10 and look at this verse. This is an amazing verse. 
Verse 1 says, brethren, he's talking to the church at Rome, the saints in Rome, largely Gentiles. It was a mixed church, but largely it was Gentiles. He says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They didn't know. Therefore, they didn't appreciate. It, their, their system of worship had become um, merely show, outward show, going through the motions. There's a great danger for that happening, happening to Christians today. And I think we're seeing it play out in a lot of cases with churches today um, where, and I don't like this term at all, but it's very popular. Um, going to church, church goers. The Lord's people are not church goers. We're not church goers. We are members of the body of Christ. That's what we are. We are members of the body of Christ. Now, sure, we go to assemble together, but the, the phrase go to church almost means, it's almost like going to the market or going to the bank or going to school or going to work. It's part of your life. This assembly is our life. It's who we are. It's who we are. So Paul originally went to the Jews and just got so frustrated and fed up with them that he washed his hands symbolically and focused his attention on the Gentiles. Why? Because at this time they wanted to hear. They were willing to hear and they were responding. Now he continues by saying this in verse 14. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, that I might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And this is really the main point right here, these next couple of verses. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the brute be holy, the branches are holy. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if, if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root bearest thee. Now what's he talking about here? So this olive tree, which clearly represents, there's no particular olive tree. It was none of the trees that Jesus went you know, as I was preparing this message, I, I got to thinking about Jesus as a little boy. Th this was very close to where he grew up, and I, I'm wondering if he ever, as his family went to Jerusalem for the feast, if the kids would ever go out and play in, the, in these olive groves, in the olive trees. Um, that'd be interesting to think of Jesus himself as a little boy kind of climbing in the trees. They were very climbable. They are very sturdy and strong. But I can picture the kids doing that. But these olive trees just represent something. They represent something heavenly and bigger. It represents a spiritual promise, a promise that God made to one man, Abraham, that through his seed, all the nations would be blessed. That is the root and fatness of the olive tree. It's solid, it's sound, it's planted in the truth of God. It, it does not go away. However, the branches of the tree, which represent the people of God. Some of them were broken off because of their unbelief. But then God also grafted into the olive tree, um, this, this olive tree, another branches from another olive tree, a wild olive tree. He grafted them in. Folks, that's you and I, by faith. When we are saved by the grace of God and we're baptized and unite with his church, we are grafted into the promises that God made to Abraham. We are the children of Abraham through the Lord's church. Now, I know that's a lot to digest, and there's a lot more. And I, I do want to at some point go into to more detail on, on each of these elements, the olive, the oil, the leaf, the branches, the root, the fatness of the tree itself. But there's one thing I want to focus on specifically this afternoon as we think about these things. So one of the main places of this Mount of Olives, a very popular place, and by the way, not only were there olive trees all around in this, I'm not sure how many 
square miles this this uh, garden took up. Um, in fact, I, I heard one man say who was kind of talking about it that you know we in our minds as Americans we think of a garden as a nicely kept orderly row of flowers and maybe some other fruits and things like that. Um, in fact, if you drive down up Highway 99 or Highway 5, you see rows very neatly planted of all kinds of different things. Um, a lot of grapes. You see a lot of grape vineyards out there, very neatly planted. It wasn't quite like that at this time. Things were just kind of wild. But it was a very special place. So there was olive trees, there was grape trees, and the grape, of course, was necessary as well um, because that was a big part of their nourishment. The oil was used for anointing um, and for cooking and other things, healing also. Um, and, and the wine was, the, the fruit of the vine was used for nourishment and celebration and things like that. Um, but there also among this place was graves, a lot of graves, ancient graves. Even to this day, there are still graves that were there. And of course, my mind, in my imagination, I was wondering if uh, Joseph of Arimathea had purchased his burial plot in that place. I don't think we know for sure exactly where Jesus was buried. But again, this place was significant. I mentioned the fact that he taught there a lot. Um, it was called the Olivet Discourse, which is found in Matthew chapter 24, and, and Luke and Mark, I forget the chapters that it's in there, but Matthew 24, I know for sure, the whole chapter is dedicated to this discourse, which is about the second coming. They ask him a question, three questions, actually. What is this? We're close enough. Let's go there. We have time enough to do this, just to look quickly at this, this place, this, this discourse that he gives. And this is the Mount of Olives. Verse 1, verse 3 tells us that. But Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 says, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him and showed him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See you not these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be one left here, um, here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That literally happened about, um, let me see, 50 some years after he says this, AD 70, no, it'd be less than that, but AD 70 is when it happened. So literally just a few years, a few decades, after Jesus makes that comment, Jerusalem was uh, ransacked by the Romans and completely leveled and torn down, and that's pretty much what we see now. Nothing is there that what it looked like back during Jesus' day. But, verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, this would be his apostles, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he goes on to answer all three of these questions in the next uh, 51 verses. This talks about his second coming. Now, what we know, we also know the end of this story as well, because not only, we're going to look at this in a moment, but after the last Passover, which wasn't too long after this time here, after he celebrated the Passover with his disciples, it says he went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, if you know your Bible, you know what happened there. Not only is it the place that he was arrested, but prior to that, he became very heavy with sorrow, not for himself. But for us, he was bearing our sins. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he was arrested there. Then he was taken all night long that night, without any sleep, he was taken to, to the temple, passed along to different leaders, as you know, on trial, a fake mock trial the whole night. Finally, the sentence is given that he is to be crucified. Then he was taken out of that city, Jerusalem, over to the Mount, Mount Calvary which is where he was crucified. Then he was taken off the tree. As you know the story, he was buried. Three days later, he, ar he rose again on the third day. And he taught his disciples for 40 days. Well, maybe not every day for the 40 days, but he was seen among them for 40 days. 
Then, right before he ascended into heaven, which was on the Mount of Olives, he says in the book of Acts, um, let's look at it real quick, chapter 1. This is on the Mount of Olives, verse 9. It says, We have spoken these things. While they beheld him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them, um, by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner, so have you seen him go into heaven. And, of course, this mountain here in verse 12 is Mount Olivet. That's what Zechariah was talking about. When their Messiah comes. Now, they're, they're missing something. In fact, the, to the Jews' understanding now, when their Messiah comes, he's going to come to the Mount of Olives. And he's going to conquer all of their, their enemies. And they, they look at the, the prophecies of Zechariah and they see that happening when the Messiah comes. But they missed something. They missed his coming. But he didn't come the first time, as we know now, and they could have known by faith, but he didn't come to conquer the world. At that time, he came to bear the sins of the world and die on the cross. That also is contained in the scriptures. So they're, they're missed that whole part. They don't see that part of it. So now they're looking for their Messiah to come, and their Messiah will come. But he won't be the real Messiah. He's going to be a false Messiah, a false prophet. The Antichrist is going to come and deceive not only Israel, but the nations. We need to be careful as the people of God, that he does not deceive us as well. Because the Bible tells us that he is going to have such power of deception and lying wonders that if possible, he'll deceive even the very elect. So we have to be careful. But at some point, Jesus is going to descend out of heaven and come back to the Mount of Olives, where he ascended from. That's what's told. Now I want to shift gears. I want to talk about the, the, the more spiritual element of this. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Probably the most... I'm not even sure this is debatable. I suppose it is because especially Baptists debate everything. <laughs> but um, probably the most spiritually significant moment in all of history takes place in the Mount of Olives. And it wasn't just any time. It wasn't when Jesus went there and overlooked the city. It wasn't when he went there as a child, played among the groves and the trees. It wasn't when he <clears throat> um, went there to pray, not before this particular time. It wasn't when he sat there and taught about his second coming and the end times prior to his second coming. It's one event, one moment, where everything comes together. And Isaiah chapter 53 spells it out very clearly. We're going to start here, and we're going to go over to Matthew chapter 26. Verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 53 reads this. Well, actually, we need to go back. You know that I've talked about this before. We need to go back out of necessity to verse 13 in chapter 52. I don't know who made these chapter breaks. It wasn't King James. He gets a lot of flack for this, but he didn't do this. It was somebody else that made these, these divisions. But nonetheless, this should be included in chapter 53. So verse 13 of chapter 52 says this, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and very high. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. So he shall sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Notice the, the metaphorical usage here. We can picture our minds, a, a, and I'm not sure how often they saw this, actually. 
a young tender plant of an olive tree. Because most of the olive trees that produce anything at all, they're very old. And that's usually when people see them. But they have to start sometime, right? So as a young tender plant and as a root out of dry ground, this is interesting. He, meaning this man, has no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should de desire him. Now the olive tree, don't do this now. I know you can. But if you look up an olive tree, if you Google it and look at the images of it, it's a pretty ugly tree. It really has no form or shape, and there's nothing really desirable about it. But it's one of the most significant plants ever. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And surely that happened when Jesus was walking on the face of the earth. There was nothing about Jesus that was significantly different than any other Jewish boy or man. He looked like everybody else. There was nothing about him that drew their attention, that commanded their attention. I don't think he was... Sometimes there's a, a man, and maybe women too, that just the very presence sort of commands your attention. And when they walk into a room, it's like all eyes look at them and everything they say, people, people hear. Who is that, that bank guy? That when he talks, people listen? E.F. Hutton. E. Hutton. Yeah, when he talks, people listen, right? That's what they say. But there's nothing about Jesus. He was no E.F. Hutton. He was no, I don't know who the big, um, what are they called? Motivational speakers are. But there are some great ones that can get you thinking you can do anything. You can change your life just by listening to what they say. And they command a lot of attention. And they look good. They look like people who know what they're talking about. Jesus didn't look like that at all. He did not look like anything special. But verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. It looked like he was a man being punished by God. And perhaps he was. But not because of anything he did. It was because of you and I. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, one thing I didn't really talk about on, with this place, the Mount of Olives, I did mention Gethsemane, the place that you're familiar with. But what Gethsemane was, was it means really an olive press. And it was really the place where they would, would squeeze these olives to get the juice out of them. And what this, this device, it was a very ancient device, of course. Now I'm sure they have more modern instruments to crush the, the olives to get the oil out, or the grapes to get the, the, the juice out of the grapes. And both of them are significant here. Both of them are coming to play at the same time in all of this. One, and if you think about what they both picture, the oil represents the Holy Spirit, right? And the juice of the grape represents his blood, which had to be shed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So in order to get these things active, it had to come out of him, Jesus. So symbolically, these, by these olive trees, and I forget I read how, much, um, how many pounds of fruit an olive tree will produce, but they produce a lot. They're very, they're very productive. Um, but they would take these olives, they would put them in sort of a vat type of thing, and they would have this big stone that would grind and crush each one. Sometimes, I, I don't know how they did this, but I'm, I read that they would use their hands. And I think that meant that they had some sort of like a like rock or something to crush these olives to get the oil out of these things. But reading this with that in mind and knowing the place as we do now, where he went to and what this place represents, the Garden of Gethsemane, what's going on and what happens symbolically over the centuries is becoming a reality right here with, with this man. Now verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, 
Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the, she uh, to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent or dumb, King James says, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. You know what's fascinating about the word of God is it has so many ways of bringing the reality of the life of Jesus to life. It's in the stars. It's in the world. It's in all of creation. And the Bible tells us, just really quickly, I'm not going to leave Isaiah 53 now and go to Matthew 26. But as you go there, Matthew 26, I'm going to go over to Hebrews chapter 1, which is all about the sacrifices. The Old Testament sacrifices in light of the New Testament truth. And verse 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, not only verbally with his teachings, which were very powerful and many lives were converted, uh, spoken to us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Boy, just meditate on some of these things. This is one of the best... These three verses are some of the best verses to just meditate on and to think on. And then this one, by whom the worlds were made, being the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hands of the majesty on high. Now as we go to Matthew chapter 26, very significant things are all coming together at one time. Almost all of the Old Testament sacrifice, I'm going to use the word rituals, but really they were habits, they were traditions, they were appointed times, um, are all coming to reality um, during this series of events. Not the least of which was the, this Passover, which was the first day of unleavened bread. Now, after the Passover, I'm going to start reading in, let's start in verse 26. This is like towards the end of this Passover meal. Jesus knew all along what was taking place. All the prophecies were coming to pass right here. But they didn't know that. I'm not, in their minds, this is just one of 30 or so, a whole lifetime of celebrations of the Passover that they have experienced. And they were expecting another one, you know, next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. But they didn't know that this was the very last one. So as Jesus is eating with them during this feast, towards the end, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. Of course, the bread was unleavened. So much significance to that in what it pictures. His sinless body. He blessed it and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take eat. And they never heard this before. This is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks. These are very, every Passover feast has these elements. Everyone, but never had these words been said before this time. It says he gave thanks, gave it to them and said, drink you all of it. This is my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant. The, all, the new olive tree now comes into picture here, which is shed for the remission of sins, for many for the remission of sins. And I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until that day when I shall drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And that will take place when he returns. So when they had sung a hymn, they went out now to the Mount of Olives. This place again becomes highly significant. Then Jesus said unto them, all of you shall be offended because of what this night, because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. He's quoting from one of the Psalms. But after I am risen, I will go before you to Galilee. This is not the first time he talked about dying and resurrecting. He said that many times. But now it's really going to happen. Peter answered and said unto him, The wall men shall be offended because of you. I will never be offended. How many of you think you would be like Peter and say that? 
Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me thrice. Three times. Peter said unto him, Though all should die, excuse me, though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise, the other disciples said the same thing. Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane. That word's not really found too many times, but again, it means the wine press or the olive press. He said to the disciples, sit here while I go yonder now and pray. I wonder if he went to the same spot that he always goes, or he always went to to pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And I, there, there's no way English words can put, can convey what that actually means. Um, imagine the so most sorrowful time in your life and the heaviest you've ever felt where your heart is just hurting and multiply that by billions billions because your sorrows your burdens he is now taking upon himself then said he unto them my soul is exceeding sorrowful even to death tarry you here and watch with me he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying oh my father if it is possible, let this cup pass for me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came unto the disciples and found them asleep, and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, and how true this is, because we all experience this. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, and their eyes were heavy. And he, he left them and went away again. He prayed the same time, the same thing, third time, saying the same words. Then came he to his disciples and found them asleep, said, Sleep on, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise let us go, behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And then after this, of course, Judas comes with a band of um, soldiers and he's arrested. Do you ever think about it? You heard me, you've heard me talk about this before. Some of you have. What's he asking for here? Was he asking of God? Because he's deep in prayer. He's bearing a heavy burden. And his request is for this cup to pass from him. There's two considerations. One is that he's under such duress, such a strain because of he knows what's about to happen. He's been talking about it his whole ministry. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be shamefully treated, brutally beaten. Then he's going to be hung on a cross. And he's going to die. And then he's going to rise, <coughs> excuse me, rise again the third day. But his mind is on the fact of the, the torture, the sufferings, the beatings, and his humanity is pleading with God for this not to happen. That's one common theory. You may hold that theory. Um, I happen to think otherwise. I think what's happening here is that the sins of the world are being imputed to him, charged to him, and he's literally burying them in his body. And the weight of our sins on his body is causing such duress, such distress in his body. Luke tells us that he began to sweat great drops of blood. His body was going through something. He was about to die. And he would have died. But the Bible tells us that the only reason a man dies is because of sin. And he's about to die right here in the garden because of our sins. Now think about this. The Bible tells us that he had to go to Calvary. He had to go to the cross. If he doesn't go to the cross, you and I are lost in our sins. And Satan has done his best to try to prevent Jesus all along the way from going to the cross, even from the time he was born. So he, he was unsuccessful. But now you and I are standing in the way. Our sins are so heavy on him that he's about to die, and he knows it. So I believe that his prayer to God is to deliver him from this moment that he can go to the cross. 
to be spared from this time of death so that he can go to the cross. In fact, Hebrews chapter 5, let's go there really quick. Hebrews chapter... We read this in verse 7, speaking about Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and he was heard in that he feared. God heard his prayer and spared him from death. He saved him from death right there in the garden. We know Luke's gospel again. It goes into a little bit more detail on some things. But God sent an angel to him to strengthen him so that he could go to the cross. His flesh was brutally um, torn down because of our sins. And then, of course, he was arrested on that night and taken away. The amazing thing about all of this is... I know I talked about a lot of things. I may have lost some of you along the way. But the significance of this place called Mount Olivet or the Mount of Olives is so important to you and I. If it wasn't for this place and for this event happening here, you and I would be lost in our sins. And you know what he's asking of us? He's asking of us to give our lives to him for salvation. No, he's not. He's not asking anything from us to give. There's no amount of money we can give. There's no amount of ourselves we can give. There's no good thing you can do. You can't go to church so many times to to be forgiven of the charge against you. It's already been paid. All you have to do is put your faith in him and you are delivered. That's all he's asking of you is for you to put your faith in him, trust in him, and you are delivered. It, quite frankly, is that simple. Somebody may ask the question, what do I need to do to be saved? And the answer is simple. Paul tells a Philippian jailer, believe with all of your heart and you will be saved. And he says, you and your household. He's also asking for us to commit our lives to him. And that's no big thing. To commit our lives to him who went to these lengths for us. I'm going to continue to study this Mount of Olives and probably bring up more messages from it, but... This is such a significant place that your salvation was guaranteed right here in the midst of all of these olive trees. We're going to stand at this time and have a song of invitation. I don't know your hearts. I don't know what's going through your mind. I don't know what you're thinking about. What I do hope is that something that was said caused you to think about your eternity. If you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, it only takes a moment's time. How do I know that? I experienced it. I experienced weeks of conviction, trying to figure these things out. Some people go through a lot more than that, maybe months or years of conviction, trying to figure these things out. But all it is is a moment's time when you understand that you're guilty of sin, your condemnation is hell, you turn, you repent, you trust in him, and you are saved at that very moment. Nothing else you need to do. Nothing. You are eternally saved at the moment you put your faith in him. If you've never had that experience, if you've never done that, won't you do it now? Put your faith in him. What page, brother? Let's go to number 368. We'll sing the first and the last. 368. Jesus, keep me.
thank you for your attention this morning. I hope that each one received a blessing from the services today. Um, services this afternoon at 1.30 as usual. We're going to continue with the study, uh, a look at church history, and we're going to talk about some of the things that occurred in the, um, around the year 1850. Some of the difficulties our people struggled with and the doctrinal lies they were dealing with at that time. So please come back and join us at that time. Anything on your hearts as we dismiss this morning? If not, good to see each one out this morning. At this time, I'm going to ask Brother Easton if you would please dismiss us in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day where we can come and worship you. We thank you for all of your many blessings and for everything you do for us. We thank you for your, your life and your, um, your life sacrifice for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us. Help us to live in remembrance of you, to live for your will and your glory and your honor for us. Forgive us where we fail you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.